Hello and welcome to Policy and Politics with me, Tarun Nangya. What happened very recently in Pakistan where three women were abducted and forcibly uh, converted. These were three Hindu women who were abducted and forcibly uh, converted uh, uh, to, uh, to being Muslims and then uh, were married off ostensibly. What happened is uh, there were widespread protests because the parents of all these uh, women uh, raised a hue and cry as to you know if minorities are safe in Pakistan or no and after that Prime Minister Imran Khan ordered an inquiry uh, that the state government should inquire into the incident there and the inquiry is on now. But why this issue uh, we are discussing today? Because there is a citizenship amendment bill which is pending uh, in parliament and political parties have taken different sides to the issue. Uh, uh, there are a uh, clutch of regional parties in India including Assam Gana Parishad or uh, also uh, the Congress party which is saying that we will scrap the bill and BJP is saying because they introduced the bill they say that we want this bill to be passed and we shall pass it though we must tell you that it was into I mean this is a 2016 bill so far not passed. What, what does it entail? The bill entails uh, that minority communities in the countries of uh, like Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan such as Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsi, and Christians. All these people living in Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan will be eligible to apply for Indian citizenship. And once this bill is passed, all these communities in these three countries can apply and become an Indian citizen. So for example, these three women who were forcibly abducted, uh, Hindu women and made Muslims, these uh, can also apply and become an Indian citizen. Uh, now in this perspective, we are going to discuss this issue. I have a uh, J. Sai Deepak as my guest today who is well informed on uh, issues related to the Indic community. Uh, he is an advocate in the Supreme Court of India. Uh, Sai Deepak, thank you for sparing your time for this episode of Policy and Politics. Uh, I would want to ask you, could you lay the ground for us? What happened in Pakistan and the Citizenship Amendment Bill? These two things. When East Pakistan and West Pakistan were created in 1947, the population of Hindus uh, in both these countries or, or in both wings of Pakistan was together around 23 percent and this population or this number fell down to 3 percent post the creation of Bangladesh in 1971. So that means a significant number of Hindus in the erstwhile Pakistan which is pre-1971 existed mostly in Bangladesh. And if you see the attacks of the army of West Pakistan on the Bengalis in East Pakistan prior to the war of 1971 and before the creation of Bangladesh, it was largely the Hindu intellectuals and the Hindu women who were raped. Around it, the number is about 3 lakh Hindu women were raped at the very least by the Pakistani army to teach a lesson to Hindus or especially the Bengalis, so to speak. Now what this tells you is that there seems to be a general animus which could either be traced to 1947, the very foundation of Pakistan, its founding ideology and its thorough belief and adoption of the two nation theory as a concept, as a doctrine, as a founding doctrine. But after 1965, the situation even worsened and this is largely attributed to General Zia ul Haq and others. But I believe that to point fingers at Zia ul Haq is actually to miss the point and ignore the foundational concepts and doctrines of Pakistan itself. So, it is not my view that the situation was better between 1947 and 1965 and suddenly in 1965 the situation changed. Nothing changes overnight. There must have been sufficient building blocks, there must have been sufficient sentiment which ultimately found some kind of an expression when the right person arrived at the top. Now what has happened over the years is systematically they have adopted a policy of targeting Hindus in Pakistan, Sikhs in Pakistan and other minorities also. In fact, uh, one of the most popular uh, examples which the world is aware of is that of Asia Bibi where she was actually accused of blasphemy and then the Supreme Court of Pakistan had to interfere and stop her, uh, her punishment. I think she was given the capital punishment. I, I suspect she was given the punishment. The West had to intervene and all that happened. But then Asia Bibi was a non-Hindu, non-Muslim, I think she was a Christian if, if I'm right in yes. terms of her religious she identity. Was Therefore there was a significant intervention from the West. But what has been happening to non-Christian communities and non-Muslim minorities in Pakistan over the decades has some, is something that is something that has not received any kind of attention from the West at all. Now the question that we have to ask ourselves is why is it that India needs to interfere in this particular issue? Why do we not treat this as the internal affair of another country, of another yeah, sovereign nation? Yeah, because Pakistan nation? is a sovereign state by 
required definition. Their issues are their issues, our issues are our issues. Right. Now, to take that position would be to forget that at one point of time, these were all people within the same subcontinent, within the same country. Therefore, we have some responsibility towards them, especially when the two nation theory is so deeply ingrained and seared into the memory or let's say the living worldview of the majority of Pakistan, that others are bearing the brunt of that particular worldview. India has a responsibility for one good reason. Assume for a moment that any Muslim anywhere in the world, in any part of the world, were to be affected as a consequence of persecution, whatever it may be, at least there is an organization, a pan-world uh, organization by the name, the Organization of Islamic Countries, which takes upon itself the responsibility of speaking on their behalf, which looks out for their interests. I don't think there is a single such organization which takes up the responsibility to speak on behalf of Indic communities. I'm not limiting this, this proposition only to Hindus. This applies to Indic communities, communities whose religions, whose origins, and whose culture traces its origins to India. You mean it could be the Eastern thought, which means Buddhists also? Of course, Buddhists also. For me, it, this includes Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs, to a significant extent even Parsis, because at the end of the day, they have naturalized as in, uh, in exactly over 2000 years and they have come here they have assimilated themselves as part of this particular land they have contributed to this particular land and they do not ascribe or subscribe to a certain worldview which is antithetical to the rest of the country they have integrated themselves to the culture of this land therefore india is the natural homeland for indic communities and if you go back even further it is possible to make the argument that parsis are also an indic community because of a shared common civilizational heritage and origins therefore india has a responsibility towards these communities. So, but I want to ask you, and there is a question in my mind, that yes, Hindu yes. women are forcibly being converted, yes. abducted and converted in Pakistan, and this right. has been happening. So, we saw, because young Hindu women in Pakistan were not allowed to go out of their house, right. because there was a fear that if they venture out of their house, right. if they go to school or college, they will be abducted and converted. And this is not in cities, right. but in small towns of Pakistan, right. or villages of Pakistan. Right. And we saw hundreds of Hindus coming to India and settling here uh, in uh, Delhi itself. Yes. And this has been happening. Uh, Pakistan by itself is a country that allows all religions to flourish within the country. Uh, so not that you know it only allows Muslims to stay, it allows everyone to be a citizen. Right. So I want to ask you that whether is it that only Hindus are being forcibly converted to Muslims in Pakistan or even right. Muslims are being converted to Hindus. Right. Because you follow the region quite carefully, right. have you come across any such case in Pakistan where a Muslim was converted to being a Hindu, where a Muslim woman was abducted and converted as a Hindu? Right. Did this happen in Pakistan ever? Not, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay. And uh, notwithstanding the promise of secularism and equal treatment of all religions by Mr. Jinnah, yes. uh, when, the, when the state of Pakistan was founded, yes. the backdrop in which it was founded and the subsequent conduct really doesn't sit well. So in the face of the what they are prescribing is not showing through? There is a serious difference between the proposition that is put out at a normative level saying that this is what we wish to be and this is what we are. Mm -hmm. And it is at serious loggerheads with the conduct at the behavioral level. Okay. The ground realities don't meet and they do not sit well with what is being touted as their civilizational policy or as their country's policy. So you mean Christians and Hindus are being converted, but Muslims are not being converted to other communities. So you know, you mean that is why Hindus are being persecuted? See, there are two kinds of breaks. One, that there is a clear uh, difference in treatment between someone who is a Muslim and someone who is not a Muslim. That's one. In Pakistan. In Pakistan. Second, even within the Muslim community, there is a problem as to who is the true Muslim, whether the Ahmadiyyas qualify as Muslims or not. So there is an internal rife as well. However, for all practical purposes, for the rest of the world, the Ahmadiyyas are Muslims and they, they see themselves as Muslims. So the larger issue that perhaps India must take note of is the difference in treatment and the discriminatory treatment that is meted out to non-Muslims in that particular country. Now, it is not, it cannot be our position that we will interfere to the extent of actually inter interfering militarily or yes. in any other way. Yes. But it is available to the good offices of India yes. to exert some kind of pressure because at the end of the day we have a responsibility, a civilizational responsibility, a moral responsibility and I dare say even a legal responsibility as far as people of Indian communities are concerned in these places. Look at it this way. When the Taliban came to power, not only were the Muslims affected, the moderate Muslims or the secular Muslims of Afghanistan, they particularly went after the Hindu communities and the Sikh communities who continued to live in Afghanistan at that particular point of time. So they were targeted. In fact, they were asked to leave the country, either convert or die. This was effectively the diktat that was given to them. So 
as opposed to ascribing this to any particular faith or to a particular people, I will ascribe this particular motive to a mindset, to a mentality, to an ideology. So that brings me to another question. If you see the Citizenship Amendment Bill, now regional parties and the Congress say they want to scrap the bill. Yes. Because uh, you are only allowing minorities such as uh, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains and Parsis and Christians right. Right. from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan to right. apply for Indian citizenship and get it. Right. Uh, it is not allowing Rohingya Muslims to settle in India. Right. It also, uh, so this is a point of objection raised by these parties that right. why this treatment cannot be meted out to Rohingya Muslims also. Right. Why shouldn't they get this right? right. A. Uh, B. You had uh, Sushma Swaraj, our external affairs minister, making a statement that India has embraced a lot of people staying in Afghanistan as citizens of their country or at least allowed them to stay because they are not inimical. Okay. Afghanistan have, you know, civilizationally has been friends of India. Right. So those people we can, uh, you know, invite to stay in India because they are persecuted in their home country but not Rohingyas. Right. Can you justify this argument right. uh, and also why the citizenship bill in your view right. keeps out Rohingya Muslims? Right. Right. So, if you look at the territories to which the 2016 amendment bill extends to, it speaks of only Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. Yes. So, there is no question of Rohingya Muslims as far as these three countries are concerned. Okay. Then the question would be, why don't you extend the scope of the bill yes. to even Rohingyas coming from Myanmar? Yes. Okay, that could be the argument. Now, there, what is important to understand is, assuming for a moment that the Hindus of Pakistan posed a security threat to India, to India's sovereignty, to its integrity, to its territorial integrity, then I think India would be well within its rights to say that even Hindus from Pakistan cannot be allowed inside the country because it owes its primary responsibility to the people of this country, regardless of the faith. Second, since there is no such security issue that has been perceived or there has been no such threat that has been flagged by the intelligence bureau, there is no such statement at all. India therefore is at liberty to fall back on its civilizational responsibility as well as its international responsibility as an aspiring superpower in this particular region. Now, coming to the question of Rohingyas. Now, you call it Rohingyas or Rohingya Muslims, it doesn't make a difference. It's effectively the same thing because that particular ethnic group has a certain religious identity and this there has been... There can't be any other religion. There can't, there can't be any other religion. In fact, that has been recorded by scholarly publications in which have actually delved deep into who are these people, what are their origins, okay. what worldview do they subscribe to and what is the religion they subscribe to. But religion is actually not the issue. The problem is... The fundamental issue that we must understand is that, is that this particular group, and I won't call it a community because that may have a different connotation, this particular group seems to have an animus with the community it was living together in Myanmar. And at the end of the day, mass graves were dug up where Buddhists were killed and children were murdered, women were raped, and all of these by organizations which have an affiliation to this particular group. Now, therefore, does it mean that every member of the group is a terrorist? I don't think so. I think that would be an extreme statement to make. But when you're looking at security as a whole, the principle that you typically apply is a precautionary principle. Is it possible for India to screen each and every person, identify what ideology they subscribe to, who do they have affiliations to, who do they owe their allegiance to? It's difficult. Therefore, the Intelligence Bureau said they cannot be in this country because they pose a security threat. But most importantly, what makes it even more worrisome is that they have landed and they have congregated at one of the most, uh, let's say, volatile flashpoints in this country and perhaps even in the world, which is Kashmir. So Rohingyas have landed up in Kashmir, not anywhere else in India. And not even in Kashmir, in Jammu, where hitherto there were not too many incidents of terror, but now the cantonments of the army have been attacked. And most importantly, in 2015, it was reported that a Rohingya was found, uh, was killed as part of a terrorist action, anti-terrorist action by the Indian army. That means there was a Rohingya connection way back even in 2015. Okay. So, so given so asylum in India, he had attacked India. No, no, even before giving an asylum, even before this particular issue of Rohingya's persecution came to light, that was already the case. So there was already some kind of an affiliation. Most importantly, this group has been asking for the creation of an autonomic, sorry, autonomous Islamic enclave in Myanmar or the creation of a separate Islamic state altogether. Now, with these kind of aspirations that they have, how can you be so sure, and particularly in a place like Kashmir, where the passions always run high, that they will not create further trouble. Most importantly, over the last two to three years, the presence of this particular group and their individuals is no more limited only to Kashmir. There are multiple reports that they've reached various parts of the country, even in the deep south. 
In fact, there was one news report from what I remember that there was a train going to Kochi where there were a significant number of Rohingyas. So I think this raises serious security concerns. It is not a question so of... Is officially yes. being given uh, a refugee or they have come into India? They have not been given the status of refugees so in this country they, at all. How are they coming into India? They are coming through illegal channels. Ah, so this is illegal channels. It is an this illegal is channel. Giving, uh, Just as several Bangladeshi illegal immigrants have found their way the into India, pattern. it is not just the same pattern, it is the same channel as well from what I have understood so far and what people have actually reported. Okay. Better informed people who have been part of the security apparatus have also said that is the same people. In fact, they see this as the third wave of illegal Bangladeshi migration. Okay. So because this is at the end of the day, Rohingya Muslims in colonial records yes. were treated actually as Bengali Muslims. Okay. Okay. So it's a, it's, it's a very interesting discussion, but uh, I would also want to ask Jay Sai Deepak that uh, there is an argument presented that uh, should Shias and Ahmadiyas, who as Sai Deepak himself said have been persecuted in Pakistan, should they then be allowed citizenship of India under the Citizenship Amendment Bill because they have been persecuted, they are Muslims and they have been persecuted in Pakistan. Uh, uh, so should, should we also include them in the Citizenship Amendment Bill? We'll discuss this with him after the break. Welcome back. Just before the break, we were discussing the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Uh, Sai, I want to understand from you, we have uh, uh, invited and allowed so many Afghanistanis to come into India. Correct. And uh, you, 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 you explained in your own way why you think Rohingyas uh, are not being included in the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Right. Uh, so to say or extend that apparatus to even Myanmar. Right. Uh, could the Citizenship Amendment Bill also apply to Muslim sects like Shias and Ahmadiyas who are being persecuted in Pakistan specifically? Right. right. See, both when it comes to Shias, Ahmadiyas and uh, Rohingyas, the common argument that is made is India has about 1.25 billion people. Yes. It, therefore, what difference does it make if a couple of more lakhs come in or a couple of more thousands come in? It doesn't make a difference. And India has always been welcoming of people, so on and so forth. But the one point that we have to remember is law also has a role to play in this and security considerations also have to play a role in this. In a situation such as this, you apply what is known as the principle of non-refoulement, which means when a person who is persecuted in a certain country seeks asylum in your particular country, even if you have not given him the status of a refugee, you cannot push the person back to the very same territory where they are persecuted. Okay. So India cannot push, let's say, Rohingyas back to Myanmar until the situation there changes and they have some kind of a sovereign let's say commitment from the government of the particular country that they will not persecute these people and they'll take them back and treat them properly. Now that we have got the particular assurance, Bangladesh itself is sending back Rohingyas back to Myanmar. They are is, yes, they are sending them back. Bangladesh is saying, all these days we did our best to share whatever little resources we have with these people. Now that we have received a commitment from their country, we want them to go back. But and under some the responsibility is even India donating to yes. Bangladesh for Rohingyas? Yes. So, so there is, under the principle of non refoulement there are multiple options available to any country. Okay. One, do you take them and rehabilitate them in your country? or? Do you provide them assistance, give them a dignified treatment and wait for situations to become conducive for their deportation or for their repatriation, so to speak, in their country? There are reports that India has supported Bangladesh and uh, other countries when it comes to taking care of this particular community, financial assistance, relief material, all of that has been said. Okay. And the OIC also is inviting them to stay in the... Uh... Not to the best of my knowledge. I don't think there is a single Muslim country which is part of the Organization of Islamic Countries which has come forward and stepped forward to say that we will take care of these people since they... So this community is not being... Uh... Not, not at all. Europe seems to be much more welcoming of refugees from Syria than OIC countries of... Rohingya uh, group. Okay. Okay. So that seems to be a paradox is which that, is in, that, in that, that, I mean, does this thing surprise you? Why is OIC not welcoming of Rohingyas? See, see, it does certainly seem to be surprising because a lot of these countries are pointing fingers at India and other countries that we are not doing enough yes. to take care of this particular issue. Yes. But then at the end of the day, if they have taken an interest to comment on this particular issue, let them step forward and also share the responsibility. I mean, they should also be accepting these refugees yes, in, they uh, should. in at least some lakhs. At the, at the very least, a number of these Gulf countries, the GCC countries are much more wealthy compared to India. Yes. These are oil nations and where there, are, where there are no taxes at all or at least there is no income tax so to speak. Yes. India for all practical purposes is still a third world country. Yes. It is still developing, it is not developed but there are developed nations who are part of the Gulf community. Yes. So why don't they take up the responsibility of doing this? What steps have they taken to reach out to Myanmar or to Bangladesh to help them change the situation? Yes. Why is India responsible for all of this? Yes. We have enough of our own issues yes. and if when when this group, which already has a security red flag, lands and flashpoints, 
we are potentially ourselves responsible for creating a future problem. Okay. So if, if we extend uh, our discussion on the Citizenship Amendment Bill, now clear battle lines are drawn. You yes. see the Congress taking a certain stance, yes. the regional parties and the BJP. Yes. What is the basis of both the parties taking divergent views right. and do you think they are justified one way or the other? See, I do not want to hold brief for any single political party because at the end of the day, regardless of what anybody says, there are political incentives or disincentives in taking a certain from position. From the legal point of view, how would you explain? I am going to take a position from a legal standpoint, from a civilizational standpoint, and what should be our national security approach. Point number one is considering the fact that India has a responsibility to people of Indic origin wherever they are persecuted in the world, India has an obligation to give them asylum. That I think is the responsibility, the civilizational responsibility that India has. I am focusing only on the word civilization, no other connotation at all. Second, from a legal standpoint as well, these people they don't approach any other country for asylum. They come to India because they expect that this is one place where their problems will be understood because their problems are no different from the problems of people who suffered at the time of partition. Okay. The treatment that they are being meted out and the conditions that they live in at this point of time is no different from the condition of Hindus and Sikhs and non-Muslim communities which suffered at the hands of a certain ideology in Pakistan or before the creation of Pakistan which led to the creation of Pakistan. Therefore, we are best placed to understand what they are going through. Three, the doctrine on the basis of which I assume that the 2016 amendment bill is, is, is actually carved out and it is based on is legally not at all flawed. It may have certain implications as far as India is concerned. In what sense? Northeastern states, especially the state of Assam, has a certain special arrangement with the Union of India wherein there is a promise that's been made to that particular state and other states that their indigenous identities will be protected. And since they've already borne the brunt of illegal Bangladeshi immigration, they do not want any further dilution of their identity, which I think is a legitimate issue. However, that does not mean you junk 2016 Amendment Bill altogether. Okay. What it means is, all the states of India must step up and take the responsibility when it comes to rehabilitation of these refugees. For a very long time, Rajasthan has been doing this because they are living in the border, it's a border state and therefore they are, there are significant uh, numbers who are actually in Jodhpur, Jaipur and other places. There is a beautiful NGO by the name Nimitikam, which is actually at the forefront of providing help for this particular community, the Pakistani Hindu refugees or the Sikh refugees as well. And they liaise effectively between the community and the home ministry to ensure that these people get decent treatment. They get some kind of, uh, let's say, driving licenses. There is a source of livelihood. They've been doing this. But fortunately, what has happened is after a very long time, as opposed to non-state actors or NGOs taking the responsibility for this, for the first time, India as a state has started taking a position on this issue. But it has already got a political color. It has acquired a political hue. And this politicization is bad for multiple reasons. That means even national security is going to be sacrificed at the altar of political expediency and political brownie point scoring. So my suggestion would be that you approach this from three aspects. Civilizational, provided it is legal, and provided it is moral. And provided it, just, it does not treat people unequally on the basis of religion. But if security considerations tell you that a certain group is inimical to the interests of India, Afghans have not posed a threat to India. They have never decided to wage war against this particular country on the basis of any religion. And we have struck a clear distinction between Taliban and the rest of the Afghans. We have struck that distinction. And I am not even going to say that historically we have enjoyed great relationships. At the end of the day, uh, Amateur Abdali was an Afghan. Yes. But when the nation of Afghanistan was created, and over the last few decades, we have enjoyed a fantastic relationship because India's role and reputation in Afghanistan is extremely positive. It is seen as playing a constructive role. India enjoys a fantastic reputation among the common population. So these are the reasons why it is possible for us to rehabilitate Afghans in this country. But when somebody says that it wants to create a specific autonomy, autonomous Islamic Republic and cannot live with any other community, Inviting those people in this particular country creates a, pop, a problem for everyone in this country and not anyone of a particular faith. Okay. So on principle, you say that you agree with the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Yes. And yes. It, it may have its own share of flaws or certain issues which have to be addressed, but, but in principle, I agree with it. On principle, you agree with it. Yes. And um, you also agree and you also put the fact that India has a responsibility for Indic communities, yes. wherever yes. they are persecuted, yes. to be anywhere, sent anywhere within India, anywhere yes. in the world to be, yes. uh, you know, to be given Indian citizenship. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, if 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 you can sum up today's whole discussion in about uh, say one or two points, uh, what what would that be? What challenges India facing today with regards to refugees coming into India? 
See, a country which aspires to be a superpower at some point of time must be in a position to assert itself at least regionally and influence the outcomes in other countries, particularly when it affects its own interests. Any Indic community or any member of any Indic community who is affected anywhere in the world, especially in the immediate neighborhood, India has a responsibility to speak up and stand up. Now, there are two ways of doing it. One is to keep putting pressure on the other country, which will invite the criticism that you are interfering with their religious affairs or internal affairs. The alternative is to open your doors to the persecuted community so that they can come into this country. So the critics of this particular bill, the 2016 bill, don't want India to make any comment whatsoever on the status of Indic communities and the treatment in, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. At the same time, they don't even want India to open its doors to these people in this particular country. I certainly understand the concerns of certain northeastern states, but that does not mean India cannot accommodate those concerns and also take care of these people. It is possible for us to do so. It, it must be possible for us to do so. So I think we must address this from three standpoints. It's national security, civilizational responsibility, and the legal position when it comes to Article 14, treatment of everyone equally. That is a position that we must be in a position to draw with a certain level of nuance. And addressing this in broad strokes will only lead to a lot of problem and mischievous uh, arguments being presented to present one picture or the other. As a consequence of which, what will happen is India will then say, or any government will say, this is too much of a hot potato and let's not touch it. What will happen next? Uh, it's not even women who are being raped or abducted or converted. It's minor girls. So they're not even women. It's minor girls who are going through this treatment, and each day there are at least 15 cases that are reported. This is not one or two cases. Not at all. Each day there are 15 cases, they are not even reported. The irritating part is, or the frustrating part is, the intelligentsia in Pakistan and the liberal voices in Pakistan are much more vocal about this particular issue and the treatment of Hindus in, this particular, in, in that particular country than the so-called liberals and the so-called uh, bleeding hearts in this particular country. So uh, you make a very interesting point to close this discussion. Uh, the last word has not been said yet. We will continue our discussion with Sai Deepak on the Citizenship Amendment Bill because uh, it has become a contentious issue and it also now become a political issue. Uh, and we will come with a part two on this uh, topic. but. That time is up for now. Thank you so much, Sai, for joining us on this uh, topic today. Thank you, viewers, for joining us. Thank you.